Hello, everybody, for today's joint webinar from IRSweep and TGK Scientific. We will start as exactly four o'clock as announced. So please uh, use the chat box during the presentation as we will address the questions at the end of the webinar. My name is Florian Eigenmann and I'm your host today. A uh, quick introduction from my side. Uh, I'm actually received my PhD in chemical engineering from the ETH of Zurich, did uh, several years uh, spectroscopy work at Brooker, then uh, at Metro Toledo, worked also with a as a technology and application manager. And then since two years, I'm jo I joined as head of sales IR suite. So I want also to introduce Ted King. Ted King is a pioneer in stop flow applications. And I'm very happy that he joins today. Ted graduated in mechanical engineering, then worked for several years in aerospace before becoming the technical manager for high tech scientific products. And he spent 35 years working in instrument design and development for fast kinetics. Ted himself established TGK Scientific 15 years ago as a founding director where he has continued to develop instruments in collaboration with some influential scientific colleagues and collaborators. Ted was instrumental to get the first joint webinar regarding stop flow and dual com spectroscopy going. This is a new generation of iron spectroscopy as the limitation of monitoring these processes is no longer the spectroscopy anymore. So the outline for today, I will briefly, less than 10 minutes, go over the application, which we, what we reported so far, the dual comp spectroscopy, catch a little bit on previous work we done with rapid reaction monitoring, then hand over and introduce Raphael Horvat. He will discuss specifically the stop flow reactions, what we did during the last few months. And then at the end, we have a Q&A session with Raphael and Ted on the panel. So those are the benefits which you have when you look into dual com spectroscopy. That's on one hand, the high speed advantage, then the high resolution, the multi wavelengths possibilities, so parallel that you have very se several wavelengths, not just one broadness. And then the brightness, uh, where you have a lot of light as the source is a laser instead of a global source. Today, we focus on the speed advantage specifically for those applications, as I mentioned before. The applications which we have done so far are protein kinetics, combustion diagnostics, and I mentioned last time also a little bit the polymer chemistry applications you will find them uh, as we speak anyway on the on the home page we did quite a lot of work with combustion diagnostics you see here also uh, uh, one of the founder marcus geyser doing some experiments at a shock tube at kaust university we reported previously re rapid reaction monitoring now, this is a really nice story. We have already 150 spectra per second. That was last or beginning of the year, just in January. You see here the possibility when you initiate such a reaction uh, with UV light, that's the glue hardening. It's actually polymerization in the end. And this reaction takes place in two or three seconds. So this story here, as you can see, started like already last year where we monitored 25 spectra per second continuously. And then, as I said before, 150 spectra per second in January. And now we are very proud that we can do 220 spectra per second continuously since March, 2020. Technically, it's even possible for a short period of time to go to microsecond time resolution. A quick overview about all the applications and all the 
spectrometers in the field. We have uh, more than double digit customers developing dual comp spectroscopy with us as partner, sometimes alone. Uh, we are also very proud that just today, today Ian Burgess uh, submitted his first paper. So there are a lot of publications going on in the field globally. Again, today, and then I hand over to Rafael Horvath. Uh, we focus on stop flow. We focus on the high speed advantage, not on the high resolution. There will be a future webinar where we cover other possibilities and other applications. So stop flow, those measurements which we have done just at the right time. We got some device from Ted King and had the, pos had the possibility to do that during the lockdown here in Switzerland. Raphael, which I will present now, he received his PhD from the University of Otago. Then he served actually as a research fellow at the University of Nottingham at the Michael George Group and joined more than two years ago the company Irosweep and works there as one of the application engineers. He was instrumental to get actually all this information done or all these reactions done and he will present those really nice results. Rafael, please go ahead. Rafael? Great, yep. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, thanks for the introduction, Florian. Um, so I will start by describing the spectrometer a little bit. Um, the purpose of this webinar is mostly to focus on the application, uh, but I think it's also important to see how it ties in with the with the equipment that we use to to get the measurements. Um, so you've you've probably already seen a, a picture of the spectrometer when it's when it's closed when it's on a table. Here is sort of a, a cutaway view. It's basically a, a bench top uh, size spectrometer, and the, the two main things I want to point out here is the sample compartment, which is. Um, which is actually modeled after a, a leading FTIR instrument. So it's compatible with a lot of the uh, accessories that are in use in the field. Um, and the second thing is this laser module, which you can see on the left. And the laser module is, is uh, of course, exchangeable to get to different um, wavelengths. Um, the, the detection is uh, thermoelectrically cooled MCT. So it's, it's something that doesn't require um, any liquid nitrogen. And I will talk a bit more about the acquisition schemes later. But unless I mention otherwise, it's very similar to an FTIR. So you can see at the bottom here, um, the little blocks represent uh, acquisitions. And here the gray one is a background measurement. You do this before the, the series. And then each, uh, each acquisition after that results in a single spectrum um, where the acquisition frequency is what determines the time resolution in the end. Uh, and usually this is what we use uh, for stop flow applications. So obviously we use, um, stop flow and I think it would be inappropriate for me to talk about it with uh, Ted King here so I'm just going to hand over uh, for, for this part. Thank you Raphael. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so we have um, a schematic here in this slide uh, showing the overview of the technique. I apologize to any kineticists who are amongst us today in the audience uh, but I'll just give a quick overview. So the two reagents are brought together at a mixer just upstream of the point of observation. And uh, by stopping the flow, we capture uh, a reaction volume that's just a millisecond or so old and present this to uh, typically a spectroscopic technique. And traditionally we've used UV vis fluorescence uh, methods to uh, to follow the reaction. Um, in the uh, photograph below, uh, the schematic above translates into one of our UV vis fluorescence systems, and that comprises optics, electronics, uh, sample handling, and obviously acquisition system, a data acquisition system. But today the focus is obviously for IR. And so if we can go to the next slide, We have the stop flow for infrared, uh, and this is the system that's been used in the IR Sweep lab. Uh, it's a system that enables 
two reagents to be rapidly mixed together. It's a motor-driven system. We can't actually see the mixing cell here, but we'll come to that in just a minute. Um, the Transmission cell is at the end of a thermostated umbilical, so this extends out the back of this syringe drive unit. And we have the motor-driven system, uh, which is controlled from an application. Um, if we can have the next slide. So here we see the KineDrive application where the user can set up flow rates and uh, displacement volumes, shot volumes, uh, initiate the drive. Uh, this can be customized using the scripts which sit behind the program to uh, uh, give the various uh, movements from the motor system. Uh, next slide. And this is in the lab at IR Sweep. So this is the system that Raphael's been using. So we've got a transmission cell in the bottom right photograph. You can see the umbilical just uh, extending into the cell compartment. There's a transmission cell with calcium fluoride windows. It has a 100 micron path length. And in front of you, you see the, the motor drive system, um, which is used to displace the uh, drive syringes. Um, the method is that uh, the, the, uh, the spectrometer system is set up to acquire data. Uh, in other words, it's put in an armed uh, mode uh, with the user um, then controlling the shot from the application kinetic drive. It's, it does the push, the stop flow does the, uh, the shot, and at the end of the shot, there's a trigger signal which starts the data acquisition. I'll hand you back to Raphael, who will then take it on from there. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, and the only thing I will add is that uh, we actually got this uh, delivered to us right at the beginning of the, the recent lockdown. So the, the intent was for Ted to, to come to Switzerland to do the measurement with us. Um, but then in the end, I had to do them all by myself. And it was, I think it's a testament to the usability of the device that it, that it actually worked very well. Uh, or maybe it was uh, just Ted's, Ted's good instructions online. But a lot of the... A lot of the work we did was was done remotely, kind of in the way that we are uh, doing this webinar right now. So uh, it has definitely worked very well. Um, so just a brief um, overview of dual comb spectroscopy. Um, again, I won't describe the, the the nitty gritty details, but there are, there are some some things to keep in mind. So first, the first and main thing is that we're using lasers, uh, which means they're very high power. Um, they're also broadband lasers. Unlike most lasers, they consist of many, many uh, narrow lines. So it's their frequency combs. And the way we resolve uh, the actual laser spectrum is to overlay them on a, on a detector and listen, listen in a sense, uh, for, the, for the beating between the neighboring lines. If you're um, more interested in, in how this works, uh, you can get in touch with us or you can visit irsweep.com slash technology. This site has a, has a more in-depth uh, description of what what actually uh, goes on and how, how we uh, detect the, the whole frequency uh, range of the laser uh, with a single pixel detector. The main things to take away is that it's fast um, and that there are no moving parts and it's, it's all electronic. Uh, and it's also very bright because of the laser and it has to be bright to, in order to be able to be fast because uh, time resolved spectroscopy is very photon hungry and, and we're looking for, um, for very small changes of a very, um, very short periods of time sometimes. So this is the first experiment that we did. Uh, this is the hydrolysis of methyl chloroacetate. Um, people working in the stopped flow field are quite uh, familiar with this, I think. This is, this is sort of a standard test reaction. Um, and it's normally done at 0.1 molar uh, methyl chloroacetate, uh, oh, sorry, uh, potassium hydroxide. And uh, that, that leads to reasonable kinetics that we can see. Um, We've, uh, in this case, went gone a factor of five higher because we wanted to go much faster. And you can see it, it worked uh, quite well. So what you can see on the left here, this is, is a different spectrum. This is how we um, tend to acquire the data. So what that means is that uh, negative bands uh, are things that were there in the initial reaction mixture and that have disappeared. And positive bands are things that have been generated. Um, so methyl chloroacetate doesn't have very strong band in, in this region, which is why the, the negative region at 1650 is quite weak. 
Uh, but nevertheless, if you, if you look for small enough changes, you usually find uh, signatures of, of the things you're measuring. Uh, the, the chloroacetate salt that is produced, on the other hand, has a very strong band at 16.02 uh, uh, wave numbers. And uh, we, can, we can fit some very nice kinetics with about 50 millisecond uh, lifetime here. But even the, the other kinetics you can fit quite well and, and um, actually the, the fits work out uh, beautifully. So in this case, we have about 4.5 um, milliseconds of, of sort of dead time between each of the spectra. Um, and that is currently as fast as we can go using this, this uh, acquisition scheme. So I'll get back to the acquisition schemes. Um, so what I've just shown you is the, the first one, what we call long-term acquisition mode. The advantage of this is that you can measure for, for minutes or even, even longer if you want to. Um, the disadvantage is that you are limited to these sort of 220 um, spectra per second, which uh, sometimes people want to, want to beat. Um, and I guess because we have an all electronic uh, detection mode, like I just mentioned, our challenges are also kind of more on the electronic side. We need, we need to process things faster and we need to have software that, that processes things faster. So one of the things we had to do to, to get this to work properly is to introduce a, a special trigger for the stopped flow. That means you get one trigger and multiple acquisitions uh, and that has, has worked quite well. Um, but we've also adapted a different acquisition mode to, this, um, to the stopped flow technique and that's shown at the bottom. So this is what we call the time resolve mode. This uh, is really what, what makes use of the, the high speed of the, the spectrometer. And here, rather than doing many acquisitions, you just do one acquisition and it's sliced into many uh, small chunks. In, in this case, about four microseconds per chunk. Uh, then you, you trigger at, at a particular time that you designate um, as time zero. Everything before the trigger is considered uh, as a background measurement and everything after the trigger is the sample measurement. So that, we, that way you can get to four microsecond uh, time resolution, which is, is far faster than you would need, uh, reasonably need. So we tried this, um, the same experiment using this other trigger mode. Um, rather pleasingly, it looks, it looks very similar. You can see that the noise has gone up um, a bit on the, on the spectrum on the left. Um, but I think that's quite reasonable because the integration time here is 10 microseconds per spectrum. And so I think that's actually quite good um, noise. And we have, we've got an, an enormous amount of data here. So we have about 33,000 spectra um, acquired over these 130 milliseconds. I should say the drawback of using uh, the bottom of the time resolve mode is that you're limited to about 130 milliseconds. So you, you cannot go any longer. Um, the reason you might want to use this is because you can actually optimize, well, firstly, you can look at very fast reactions, but you can also optimize um, the way that the stopped flow equipment works. So in this case, uh, with, this, with this reaction, there is this problem that uh, methyl chloroacetate is not very soluble in, in water or D2O, uh, which is the solvent that we're using. And you can see the first five, five eight um, milliseconds here, actually there's a bit of a wobble. Uh, perhaps using a better solvent, you can, you can uh, iron that out and, and actually really optimize the the reaction to, to be able to get the most out of the um, stop flow equipment as well. Um, but you need these fast uh, reactions to be able to, or the, the fast integration times to be able to see this. Now we talk a lot about noise levels. If you um, watched the last webinar, um, I spent some time on this. Essentially um, what this graph is showing us is that um, with a laser source, you have lower noise. I mean, it's, it's not very surprising, but it's, it's actually quite stark. So we have about a hundred times uh, lower fluctuation, so, so lower, lower is better in this graph. Um, it shows the noise level as a function of integration time. So as, as you integrate for longer, you, you get no, lower noise as you might expect. Um, and the red lines are the, is, is the measurements taken with the iris of one and the blue line or the blue points um, are measurements taken with an MCT, a liquid nitrogen cooled MCT, liquid nitrogen cooled MCT um, detector in an FTIR. And of course, the FTR has a much harder time because it has a glow bar source. So this is where the, the laser helps to, to lower the noise. Um, so like I said, we, we mentioned this a lot, but I think this particular measurement actually shows it very nicely because we have a 10 microsecond integration time for each spectrum and you can still make out um, all the features very well. Um, if you go to a more reasonable integration time of 100 microseconds, then the, the spectra are very smooth and you, you have um, excellent signal to noise ratio. Again, the um, the kinetics here come out as about 50 uh, milliseconds. So it's, it's consistent also with the other acquisition technique. So the second uh, application I want to talk about is, um, is protein dynamics. And um, if you, 
um, well, the, the, the first reason we want to we want to mention it is it's, it's kind of a, a hot topic. It's very um, infrared spectroscopy is very useful to to um, gauge the conformations of of proteins, and it's also a more difficult experiment um, to really resolve the differences. So we wanted to use this to to test um, what we could see. So you can see that the different um, conformations of a protein from random coil alpha helix beta sheet, they all produce different spectra, um, and uh, and you can you can use mid infrared spectroscopy very easily to to distinguish those. So the laser that I will be um, using for this next experiment is at 1650 uh, wave numbers, which is ideally suited for this. So the experiment um, that we're doing is ubiquitin um, folding, and this experiment was done by Bernhard Lendl and uh, and co-workers uh, some time ago, and uh, and they used this as a test experiment also for stopped flow but mostly to characterize their, um, their lab on a chip device. So they, they wanted to characterize how, how well the mixing works in, in this device. So it felt appropriate to use a, a similar reaction. So what happens uh, is shown in the schematic on the left. Uh, ubiquitin is in 20% methanol and uh, a more concentrated solution of methanol is introduced. And that causes it to change from, uh, from a beta sheet to a beta turn. So it's a, it's a conformational change. It's not a huge conformational change, but it, it is there. And in the spectrum, it manifests as a slight uh, blue shift in this, in this uh, ubiquitin absorption band. Um, now, the, the paper that we looked at, um, they looked at the second derivative of this. And, um, and that's to, to, um, to get out the changes a bit better. So to, to really highlight what's, what's uh, happening. We use a slightly different method. We use a different spectrum. Uh, so our spectra look different, but, um, but they're actually very consistent. They show the same thing. So if you look at where the, uh, the native ubiquitin uh, is supposed to absorb, this is where our, our parent bleach is. So this is the, the stuff that disappears. And then on mixing, we get this, uh, this uh, refolded ubiquitin appearing um, at a slightly higher energy. Um, so that's very nice and it, 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 works, it works very well. Um, the kinetics also look uh, quite good. Uh, we get slightly faster kinetics. This isn't overly surprising. We don't have a we don't have a very sophisticated chemistry lab. We probably don't have quite the same um, equipment as as they had. Uh, but also, we have a lot of data points. So I'm actually very I'm very confident in the fitting that we did here, and uh, we, we've got very good statistics on, on this. Um, an interesting thing to note about this, um, I mentioned earlier that the uh, the background acquisition is usually done on, on pure solvent. In this case, the solvent changes. So you start with 20% methanol and it goes to about 55% methanol. So we had to do a solvent correction uh, to get this to work. But uh, even that is possible. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not a showstopper to, to do a, a solvent correction um, and perhaps um, a bit of solvent, um, bit, a bit of acquisition uh, methodology could have, could have uh, fixed that as well. And, uh, and I think the results are actually very convincing still. Um, so then, I guess, where, where to next? What, what do we want to do? Um, so I've talked about these two different um, acquisition schemes, the, the, the sort of microsecond to millisecond time scale and the longer time scale. Uh, we ultimately want to combine them. And there are three sort of main approaches. There's a top-down approach, which is to say we only use the, the slow acquisitions um, and make them just go a bit faster. And we've gone, as Florian said, from uh, about 150 or actually from 50 to 150 to about 220 hertz, and I think it's, it's going to go a bit further this way. Uh, the bottom-up approach would be the opposite. It's to introduce gaps into the time resolve measurement and, and extend that out. Um, and what's very nice about having a sort of an all-electronic uh, scheme is that uh, electronics are improved, and we can just uh, upgrade the process, upgrade the, the graphics cards. It's, it's in, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a GPU that does all the number crunching, and the next generation will come out and it will be 40% faster. So, um, so whether we want to or not, this is going to get faster. Um, the other things we want to do is implement some, some user feedback. So at this stage, everything is, is user needs driven. Um, and so we already implemented this, this triggering feature that I mentioned, and we, we want to do more flexible triggering. And this ties in with the scheme that you can see on the right. Most reactions followed as uh, first or second order uh, type uh, kinetic. Um, and that means at the beginning you have to trigger much faster than at the end, and that really means you can you can measure for longer um, and and not uh, generate as much data, for example. So that's something we we also want to look into. And um, 
and then finally, I mean, I think uh, more complex chemistry would be would be interesting, and it, we're already talking to people uh, to do this with. I th I don't think the the methodology is really limiting this. Um, I think it just needs to be done. So things like monitoring on surfaces or multi-step reactions, um, and and I'll be uh, excited to see what happens when this is deployed at at research labs. Um, so that uh, concludes my part of, of the presentation, and I think I will hand back to Florian. Great. Like that. Thank you, everybody. To get actually uh, specifically Raphael and Ted for for getting a lot of uh, questions over as well. Uh, use the chat box at this time. I think that's important. You still have the possibility to address questions to Raphael. And Ted, I'm not really multitasking, but here. Okay, one of the first questions which I kick off actually the session here is, can a third reagent syringe be used? I think that's a question for Ted. Yeah, thank you. Um, the answer is yes, um, we, we could uh, uh, find space to put a third syringe in. There is a sort of empty position between the current to drive syringes. This would be a, a third reagent that could be used to uh, expand the mixing ratios that are available. Um, could be used for a situation where you may have a reagent that you want to mix that is uh, uh, unstable um, before mixing and so you want to modify it, say do a pH jump immediately before initiating the reaction. So you could do it in that kind of way, adding a third drive syringe would be possible. Okay, another one. Uh, can asymmetric ratios be mixed probably also for you, Ted? Yeah, I, th th there's almost a follow up to the previous question in introducing a third syringe, but we can introduce different size syringes within the range that's available. So typically from 0.5 mLs to 5 mLs uh, can be used. They're standard gas tight syringes. So certain ratios could be implemented and uh, with a third position opened up, uh, we, we could expand those ratios by pushing two against one. Uh, so yes, it can be done within limitations. There are always limitations on what ratios can be used in a stock flow mixer. Then there's another one. What's the maximum temperature when using this system? I think uh, we, we discussed that already once. Uh, do you have an appropriate answer here? Yes, um, we, we can thermostat the, the umbilical certainly up to 60 degrees. Celsius. Um, typically, we specify it in the sort of range from plus four to plus 60. Um, only the umbilical, so in other words, only the reagent lines and the cell block are thermostated. So we're not subject to extremes of temperature around valves and syringes, which can be problematic. Users of stop flow are probably familiar with that kind of problem. Um, so yes, the temperature range can be introduced. Okay, another one which came in uh, for heterogeneous catalysis, would the detector have to be in reflectance mode? I am thinking in terms of single crystal or thin layer catalyst, catalysts to couple of the electrochemical sensing. Um, I think I, I can answer this one. So um, I believe uh, Ian Burgess from the, uh, the CLS, the Canadian Light Source, has actually done something quite similar. And um, I think their paper came out just, just last week um, where they used a single crystal and they, they bounced, it was actually a, a silicon ATR crystal and they bounced the, the light from uh, through the inside and, and measured at the top, but it was, uh, I think they did electrochemistry on the top. So you can certainly do it and you can certainly probe thin layers uh, that way. Um, I don't know of anybody who's bounced it off the outside of a crystal, for example, um, but it could certainly also be done. Uh, the other thing we're looking into uh, in terms of um, heterogeneous catalysis is to do um, a diffuse reflectance. So, um, so measuring more complex catalysts. Um, and 
I think that can also be done. But I, I think um, it can certainly be done, and I think the detector wouldn't wouldn't have to be changed. It would just um, it would just be a, a matter of changing the the geometry in the um, in the sample compartment. Thanks a lot. Another one which came in uh, is: Could you explain briefly your project devoted to the study of surface monitoring? Mm -hmm. So we're um, we're currently starting the like a, like I just mentioned the. Uh, um, the diffuse reflectance um, project. Um, to be honest, we haven't we haven't really gotten so far at the moment. So I think there will be hopefully another webinar on that at, at some point. Um, at the moment, that's that's as far as we've gotten. Um, we've also done ATR spectroscopy, which obviously probes the um, the surface a lot, um, and that works very well. I mean, that's that's as far as I can see. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the the measurements which uh, I presented at the beginning. For example, the polymer. Chemistry, the curing we did on ATR. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a good one, exactly. Then uh, I have some other questions which we prepared before. What is the dead time of stop flow? Uh, probably that's one for you, Ted. Yes, thank you. Um, it's shorter than five milliseconds. Up until now, it's actually been quite difficult to measure because we've not had a, an IR spectrometer that's been fast enough to really do this. And while we could uh, put together certain measurements using UV vis. It wasn't that easy because of the short path length of the IR cell. Um, th this should be part of the work that I hope is going to continue with IR sweep that we'll be able to make um, an actual practical measurement of this, but certainly less than five milliseconds if you just work out the flow rate and the geometry of it. Yeah, we showed a lot. I mean, uh, that is now continuously 220 spectra per second is, is possible. Probably, Raphael, can you elaborate a little bit more? What's, what's, you, you mentioned it before, but, but, but where does this go, actually? I think we can do even much more than that. Well, if, you, if you're willing to go for, um, for only one or 200 milliseconds, you can, you can go very fast. I mean, you can go to the four microseconds that I, I mentioned before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and actually, the I was I was a bit surprised at this. Uh, that the stopped flow equipment is reasonably reproducible, actually. So what you can do is is average as well. So if you want to really go to to very short time scales, uh, if 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 you have weaker signals, you can keep averaging as well and and really get the signal to noise up. Um, so at this point, I think it's it's how fast can you mix it is is the is the limiting is the limiting factor. Okay, very nice. So you would say uh, it's the, the spectroscopy is not limited at all at anymore anymore so you can really go very fast um I, I hope i hope not no okay. uh another one um what is the fastest i mean it's probably more or less the same question what is the fastest reaction that can be observed we covered that already um so there's one in the chat actually can standard okay, ATI so, yeah. units be employed yes i um, see that so i think uh the answer is yes i've used I think four four different types, um, including single bounce and multi bounce. Um, so the the early the early work we did was on a um, on a golden gate, which I think a lot of people uh, like to use. Mm -hmm. um, but what I especially like to do is is use multi bounce ATI units because uh, we can we can turn up the light a lot, so we we can actually get as much um, we can do as many bounces as we want without ever suffering from from um, from insufficient throughput, basically. So, um, so we we also have a thirteen bounce unit that we, we tend to use quite a lot. Um, so yes, uh, the answer is yes. It, it does work quite well. Then the next question, which uh, I put in actually here, is how fast can you change the laser modules, and can you rent them for a specific period? Um, okay. So the the actual exchange um, is quite quick. So it takes about uh, maybe 10 minutes to exchange. However, you would want to, um, you want to stabilize it a little bit. So you want to keep it for one or two hours, but it's not, it's not a lot of work to change the, the laser. Um, for, for renting, yes, we do have a, a rental model um, that we kind of, uh, we came up with this recently. Um, and this is for people who have lots of different projects on the go and they want to, want to just try out a laser and see if they, they want to buy it. So I think this is, this is something that's uh, that we've we've done quite recently. Uh, the idea is that everybody would have to buy at least one laser so they can actually use and, and characterize mm -hmm. the spectrometer and, and actually have have it, uh, a running system. 
But then if you want to exchange it, we, we do offer rentals as well. That's very good. Um, I don't know if you have data for that already, how reproducible are the data? Uh, do you have some information on this one, Ted? Uh, I don't, sorry. <laughs> do you have any, Raphael? I don't have any, I don't have any pictures. I can say that they are quite reproducible. I mean, you, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the different shots, it basically look the same uh, as, as far as I can tell. I mean, um, there's always yeah, a slight I mean, variation in the time constants, but, but it's far less than 10% usually, I think. Yes. Yes. I mean, good one. reproducibility should be pretty good with the way we're, with that's we're probably what we, what we can cover. Sorry, and so right? on. Yeah. That's probably something that we can cover for the next one of the next webinars. I think it's an yeah. important one, definitely. How easy is it to install and set up this, those stop-flow stop experiments? I mean, that's probably shows what, what we could achieve during the lockdown, but uh, I think both of you should give a little bit of feedback how we worked together over the last couple of weeks. Ted, go ahead. Well, I got as far as Bristol Airport and got turned around. So uh, the rest was all done by yourself and Raphael. Um, yes, I think um, it's pretty easy to install as, as you found. Um, it was shipped, obviously, complete with the laptop computer that we'd been using in the lab. Um, it's a serial connection, use USB to connect to the drive unit. I think the application Kineta Drive is quite easy to navigate. Um, and from there, you sorted out the triggering, um, which is, is also straightforward. Um, I'd have to say it's, it's easy to use, it's easy to install, but maybe Raphael ought to add his comments to that. Um, no, I mean, I, I concur with what you said. It was, um, it was quite straightforward. Um, the the one thing that caused me to, to really have to think a little bit was the how to really measure the background, and I, I sort of alluded to that with the with the changing solvents. So so that's something that needs to you have to be quite um, quite rigorous about. Um, but aside from that, um, the hardware wise, it, it was it was essentially plug and play. I mean, um, I got another question actually from the chat, which I probably answer myself directly because do you have any plans to try a fiber probe? to interface to the sample. That's definitely very interesting. I mean, we, we've done some first measurements uh, and uh, due to the strong lasers, we probably can go even to much longer mid-IR fibers. We don't know exactly uh, how long, but we did already measurements up to 10 meters. So it's very, very promising results. Another question for you probably, Raphael, has anyone tried to inject colloids 10 to 100 nanometers instead of solutions in these systems? Um, has anyone? I'm not sure. Um, I've not done it myself, at least not deliberately. Um, so this, the MCA work that I mentioned, uh, we used saturated solutions and, um, and I, there was probably a little, there were probably some MCA. Um, it was more of a suspension of MCA. Um, I, I don't see why it wouldn't work, uh, to be honest, I, I, um, but I haven't, I haven't tried it myself. Maybe, maybe Ted has, uh, has yes, some I mean, more. The only comment I could add to that is that the, uh, the galleries, the, the flow passages through the cell uh, shouldn't present any ob obstacle to uh, colloids in those kinds of dimensions that are given. I can't see a problem in principle whether you can get things to effectively mix and do what you want to observe is another matter, but uh, the principle of putting uh, putting them through the flow circuit, I don't think is a problem. Then uh, thanks again. I mean, I don't see any questions or in the chat uh, anymore, but you, we are still here a couple of hours and uh, you have also the possibility to shoot us an email. Uh, you have the emails from Raphael and me here. Uh, also, you can shoot an email to Ted directly. Thanks to the speaker, Raphael and Ted for this excellent uh, webinar with some really new results, which are very promising for the near future, specifically for stop flow measurements, but also for the fast reaction analysis, uh, specifically the 220 spectra per second. Uh, I think there's a lot of possibilities in the future. 
what you can do with Dualcom spectroscopy. So I will at this time also announce our next webinar, what we will do probably at, uh, in May 14th. So save the date for the next PCS webinar, Dualcom spectroscopy webinar. We will talk about folding and unfolding on, in sub-second kinetics. So uh, determination of secondary structures for proteins and peptides. It will be led by Marcus Mongold, our biospectroscopy expert, and uh, uh, also uh, another guy from the Fundu team, Andreas Hugi, will join. Uh, he will also give some insights in the spectroscopy and the technology. Thanks a lot again, and uh, stay healthy. Keep you posted. All the best. All the best, everybody. All the best. Thank you.